I'm very happy that all of you are able to be here. Um, our session is focusing on the question, is energy efficiency female? Um, and the role of gender for sustainable energy use. As you might have noticed, this topic is getting more and more um, attention. There was a seminar or a webinar yesterday on this topic, and there will be another one on Monday. So I think ours just fits perfectly within the scope of all the others. Um, and the, the aspects we would like to cover are pretty diverse. Um, as you may know, uh, because of Greta Thunberg, there are more and more leading figures that are female in the yeah, fight against the climate crisis. Um, and there are theories that focus more or that show that women um, are more than men able to uh, pursue social uh, values like sustainability. And from a traditional point of view, they are also more in the homemaker role and thus could maybe behave more energy efficient. Um, on the other hand, there are also um, theories that state that technologies and digitalizations are very important for the energy transition. And this is from a also traditional point of view, more a male oriented domain. So there are aspects that point in one direction and there are aspects that point in the other directions. And uh, we would like to discuss different questions here and hopefully engage with the audience more and more. But before we dive into this um, session, um, I think we should introduce us, maybe first of all, the moderation. So Julius and myself, we will moderate it. So um, maybe I, I just start, I'm Sabine Preuss and um, I'm from Germany, as you might hear because of my accent. Um, and I'm a social psychologist um, from the background. I finished my PhD last year, which focused on um, attitude change interventions for pro-social behavior. And it has a specific focus on social minorities. That's why I'm also interested in this topic. And maybe also a little fun fact about me um, is that I don't like lettuce. So when I have my, um, my lunch break at the Fraunhofer Institute for System and Innovation Research in which I'm currently working, I don't choose the salad part, I always choose another part. So I think that's all the important stuff about me. Julius, what would you like to express about yourself? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sabina, for, for this very nice uh, yeah, start into the session here. Uh, I, was, I was very happy to, to be able to, to support Sabina here in the moderation. Um, since we're former colleagues, I also worked at Fraunhofer ISI up until like two months ago. Um, now I work at NTNU, which is the uh, Norwegian University for Technology and Science in Trondheim. Um, and I'm an energy energy transitions researcher. Um, and I'm really, I I don't want to say I'm I'm interested, but I'm I really see a need to yeah, to to have more of this this gender view on energy transitions. Um I don't really have it from a scientific point of view, but I frequently get asked if I want to sit on panels. And then very often it's just males, it's just men on these panels, on these energy related panels. And I think that's something that we can actually not continue to do. So so I, at one point I decided to not go on, on panels anymore where there's only guys. And I try to uh, empower uh, other parts of society uh, to join, uh, to yeah, to go on these panels. But I feel very often that some, very often it's also the case that people who are actually put panels together are either not aware of uh, of this disbalance or just don't know cool women who want to be sitting there and also um yeah contribute to yeah contribute and maybe it also get, get to be asked some some serious questions so that's why i'm very happy here to join today um, my fun fact is that i love licorice and i'm really happy to be now in scandinavia where there's licorice everywhere um <laughs> and yeah i already told you my my way to gender so now we will continue with the four lovely guests that we have here today um but no oh Sabina, are we going to yeah. show? We're going to show the structure first, isn't that? That's the case, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's go to the structure. <laughs> just be briefly what you will be expecting or what this session will be about. First, we will just have the short introduction topic and moderation is already done. So the speakers uh, that are in the main focus of the session will be introduced or introduce themselves, um, and then we also would like to get a little more information about you from the other side of the screen. And of course, we will um, get some insights in the gender research of our four panelists. And then there will be an open discussion um, with questions from the audience, so from you. Um, so now, Julius, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you go to the next slide and then we'll see our lovely four speakers that we have today. And that's Joy, that's Martin, that's Ines, and that's Josefina. And we would love to just give you people the opportunity uh, to just introduce yourself and please do so by giving obviously your, your basic hard facts, who you are, one personal or fun fact, and then what was the way to the gender topic and why is it important to you. Maybe, Joy, you want to start to the left top and then we don't go clockwise, but we go counterclockwise just to do break something up. So then it's going to be Ines, then Josefina, and then Martin. Sounds good? Let's get started. Okay, thank you, Julius. Thank you, Sabina, for asking me to be a participant in this uh, interesting uh, session. And uh, good, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, um, I'm an emeritus professor of energy and gender at uh, the University of Twente, uh, Twente, which is in the Netherlands. But as you possibly have heard from my accent, I am British. Um, I apologize for being uh, British, or particularly for the British government. Um, I, um, I'm a still active researcher and I'm involved with the uh, IEA users TCP gender and energy research uh, program. My started life um, as a physical scientist, um, originally in ozone layer depletion, which you don't hear so much about nowadays. Um, and then I did my PhD in engineering in actually in um, energy uh, for uh, engines. And, um, well, yes, my fun fact, as you probably hear, is I have a very bad habit of telling jokes. I once had a set of students complain in their evaluation of me that I couldn't be serious or academic because I told jokes in the lectures. So, uh, OK. Um, and so another thing, when Sabina was saying about lettuce, I'm actually allergic to cucumber. And the worst country in the world to live in if you're allergic to cucumber is the Netherlands, uh, where you get cucumber with everything. Um, my route to gender came really uh, from when I was starting doing my research. Of course, as, as all young people, I have uh, the answer to the world's problems, which in my case was biogas. I thought, yes, this is the answer to uh, the to women carrying fuel wood on their heads. Great stuff. You also get a clean fuel to cook with and you get a fertilizer. What? Nobody's using it. And I couldn't understand why. And then I had one of these light bulb moments, which thought, well, you know, in your daily life, you're a feminist. Why on earth are you not putting the two and two together? And that really the, the problem here is related to, uh, to gender roles and relations. And that's what I've been spending most of my time trying to unpack this, uh, this issue uh, with uh, for some, some time now. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you, Joy. Now we continue with Ines. And to everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I am an environmental psychologist by training and during my research life I had a focus on behavior change and habits, mainly concerning mobility behavior. And I have been working and I'm still working at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. And uh, some years ago I was convinced to um, candidate for Equal Opportunities Officer. I was quite shocked because my image was quite um, bad about these positions. And um, I had a long thought of doing this or not, but then I did it. And it was one of the best things I could do because it enlarged my horizon enormously. And um, since last year, I'm now head of the team diversity inclusion. And my focus is uh, changing structures and cultures to be more inclusive in research. And so this is kind of a cross fertilization of the focus behavior change as a psychologist, the focus of environmental impact by the center I'm working at, and also the dimension of gender diversity. And so with this package, I'm now doing my best to uh, fight for inclusive and fair surroundings in research. And my, yeah, let's say personal fact, I'm a big fan of Sherlock Holmes from my childhood onwards because I ever loved the idea of deduction and the challenge and the benefit of unbiased thinking. Oh, you, you, nice. <laughs> we get cucumber and we get Sherlock Holmes. That's really nice. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Josephine. Um, yeah, hello to everybody. Um, I'm very happy that I can contribute or join this conference uh, today. Um, yeah, I'm uh, actually, uh, I'm a research uh, uh, scientist at Fraunhofer Easy in Karlsruhe and um, Sabine is a colleague of, uh, of mine. So um, that's also the, the reason why she, or 
she uh, invited me also to participate. Yeah, and um, my future projects will focus on um, the transition in the mobility and energy sector. And as you might everybody know, um, that is a sector which maybe is very um, very structured by male um, um, opinions or male, um, yeah, let us say this um, masculinity bias, perhaps. So, and my. For me, it's like a like a goal to to contribute a little bit more of the other side of the of this debate into it. And yeah, so and what what I did before, I did my PhD project on sufficiency orientation at the University of Copenhagen Landau, and yeah, and there I was um, interested in drivers and barriers to sufficiency orientation, which I see more or less a female construct in the um, climate change debate. Yeah, and this is also a reason why I'm interested in, because um, yeah, I, my personally, I involved in this gender debate more or less uh, from a um, more activist part, and also from yeah, you, you all also uh, already talked about it that uh, that uh, Fridays for Future is a very female um, movement, so this is where also we're actively involved, and yeah, this is um, why I'm interested in this perspectives as well. Yeah, and um, a fun fact, I don't know, I'm a little bit um, confused this morning because uh, we are all in uh, quarantine and um, we maybe we have corona, but I don't think already. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so maybe that's why I'm a little bit uh, uh, hectic at the moment. So You, you seem very, very, very chill and fine. <laughs> yeah. you know, everything's good. No worries about it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for your introduction as well. Now we go to Martin. And if I'm not mistaken, Martin actually has a slide with him. So maybe Sabine. Is that not? Not the case? Then this is not the case. Apparently it was changed. Okay, Martin, off you go. Thank you yeah. for being here as well. <laughs> Thank you. That comes later on in with my uh, presentation on my research. Oh, that was the email that we just got. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Okay, so Martin Ophan, I'm a very interdisciplinary scholar. Sometimes I call myself even undisciplined um, because as uh, in my title, I have knowledge background in science, technology, and environmental studies that combined. And I've been working with uh, engineers and natural scientists re regarding energy issues for uh, more than 20 years now. Um, I'm also part of the user TCP with Joy. Um, and um, the fun fact about me, I have during this winter actually been taking uh, a swim in the lake um, once every month so it's kind of it has become a kind of a trend in sweden and i've i've joined that trend um, it's been really great actually um, my first introduction to gender and energy issues um, i have a strong memory when i was a phd started my phd 20 years back and uh, we visited a nuclear power plant and uh, there were almost only men working there. And um, they were, yeah, men workers. Um, and we were able to kind of go through there um, when, when they were changing clothes. And then you had to go through this um, machine that measured the levels of radiation um, to enter uh, the nuclear power plant and then come out. And the voice telling you if you were okay there was a really um, uh, slow and, and uh, very uh, nice female voice. So there was an extreme contrast in between these very, I call industrial male workplace and these male bodies there. And then you have this uh, female voice saying to you that everything is fine. We, we love you. You have done a good work. So that was my kind of first. And then I turned to studying the uh, gender and masculinities of Arnold Schwarzenegger. So that was kind of the next step for me in this, uh, in connection to gender and energy. Because so, Arnold Schwarzenegger okay. is such a strong dude, or what? Yeah. <laughs> so much energy in him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but also that he has actually embodied some different types of masculinities. He has changed his appearances uh, through time. Um, yeah, 
from what I call industrial breadwinner to eco-modern, and then maybe also some strands of ecological masculinities uh, when he's supporting Greta Thunberg and others today. Yeah, so that was a bit of background for me. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for giving us a little insight. And now Sabine will continue with Menti. Yes, exactly. It's really great to have this uh, quite diverse uh, panel here. And now to get to know the audience a little bit, um, I would like to ask you to go to www.menti.com and type in this code. Um, I will also try to share the screen um, or the link to access it. Let's see whether I can do that. Nope. You can also scan the QR code and I will stop the screen sharing to share the Mentimeter screen. <laughs> Let's see if I can manage to do that. Um, can you see it? Can you see my screen now? Yes. Ah, uh, there's the, the code. code uh, is the code is on top. top. Exactly. Yeah, lovely. So you should be able to join. So far, no one, oh, one person has now joined. Perfect. Yeah. So the first question is just to type in your major discipline or also if you're not having a discipline because you're not working in research, also um, your main topic you're working on. I see more and more is coming in. And the words that I mentioned several times are appearing in a larger way. That's the idea of the word cloud. You probably know that. Governance, that's also interesting, yeah. Quite diverse. Oh, we even have someone from gender studies. Perfect. OK, great. So. Many of you are from psychology and economics, but there are also sustainability is a big issue in your work, of course. I mean, otherwise you would not have joined this conference and also political science several times, governance, energy policy. Okay, so we have the social part, um, so sociology and social innovations, and then gender, but also engineering. So also pretty diverse, interesting. Oh, there's even more coming in. Cool. Okay, so pretty diverse, but sustainability now uh, is the winner. <laughs> um, so if we go to the next slide, this is a question that um, most of you probably, yeah, now you're all here. <laughs> Um, you should be able to answer this question pretty fast. Um, it's a question that is always on one of the um, on one of the um, questionnaires if you are doing quantitative research. So it's probably a little different. So what is your gender is usually the question. I changed it a little bit because uh, gender might be a difficult or a, a topic to discuss. Okay, but we have more women than men, if we want to translate it this way, um, in this group. Interesting. So just to have it in mind, maybe it will come up in the discussion again. Um, more men than uh, more women than men, even twice as much. So in the next question, we would like to know where you're coming from. So you should be able to just pin where you're from. Um, Sabine, do you mean where people grew up and were born or people are currently working? Currently working or <laughs> where you grew up and are born? That's your decision. I think where you're currently seating is interesting. Plenty from Germany, I guess. <laughs> And most of them from Europe, or all of them currently. 
Well, it is in, in European conference, so that's not really surprising, but I thought I would like to give the whole map to choose from. Everyone's from, oh, there is someone not exactly from the center of Europe. Great, but we, we see that, yeah, the focus is definitely on Europe, but it's a European conference, so maybe not too surprising. So in the next question, we would like to get a few information about your experience with gender research and gender and energy research. So just how would you rate your experience with gender research and your experience with energy research and your interests in the gender and energy research area? Because you might join this session with a very low interest just to get some, some first insights, or maybe you're very interested. First answers are coming in. So we have definitely more experience in energy research than in gender research in this, in our audience. Okay, 20 people are answering, everyone has answered. So the interest is in gender and energy research is definitely high and the highest. Um, and the experience with energy research is mixed, as you can see in on those little, yeah, hills here. And the experience with gender research is rather low. But we also have one person who's an expert. That's probably the person who's studying gender studies. <laughs> <laughs> Who would that be? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, perfect. Um, so those were the questions. So we already know a little bit more about you as well. And so that it will be a little bit more interactive, you also have the chance to answer questions um, or not answer questions, but um, post questions to the speakers during the presentation and also afterwards during the discussion. And for that, we prepared another website. Um, and I hope I can just switch if I stop this and just go there. So here, if you go to this link, which I can hopefully now post in the, let's see here, you should be able to ask questions um, anytime during the next hour, um, during, during the presentations, but also afterwards. Um, and we will have a look at it and ask the questions, but you can also just unmute yourself or raise your hand um, to ask questions um, to the panelists. Exactly. And now I'm going to stop this presentation and go back to the other presentation. And uh, I hand over to you, Julius, for the second part. Hi, hi, sorry. I think I'm winning the Luddite Award. I don't see the link. And I also managed to get kicked off the Menti before. I'm obviously not good with technology. I'm breaking stereotypes here. <laughs> That's totally fine. I will post the link again because I think I haven't posted it to all of you. Yeah, now, you, you not, now it's visible to everyone. Perfect. I just sent it to one person. <laughs> My mistake. So apparently the stereotypes are on. <laughs> okay, lovely. Then, Sabine, do you want to continue sharing um, the yes. presentation? I am about to. So we have this. Yeah, you can also enter the question, the live ask, um, by scanning the QR code. 
but you have the link. I think that's faster. And if I'm not mistaken, you can also vote up questions in Life Ask, isn't that, Sabino? Yes, yes, exactly. So we will focus on the questions that are most interesting for all of in you. And if you people are very strategic, obviously the questions that get asked early have the longest time to get voted, but I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> okay, so then let's get into the second round. And in the first round, we only asked our lovely participants to give us a little, little uh, insights into them as a person and uh, how they got into this topic of gender studies. And now we'll give each of these people, of you people, of you four people, the opportunity to uh, quickly have yeah have a short presentation about your work um, and about your research project. Um, and Sabine, I don't remember, remember how many minutes we wanted to give them. Do you know? Yes, approximately about five. Um, so just a really short insight and so aim for four and then you'll hit five probably <laughs> and <laughs> is that okay and, yeah and we start with martin not because he's male but because he has to leave early um otherwise he wouldn't start <laughs> yeah but it's also nice to break up the the uh the structure it's not the way the same structure as we had in the first round exactly. so it, that that's yeah. fitting. <laughs> cool martin i guess the floor is yours Good, great, thank you. Um, yes, something about my research then. Um, I have had and completed one research project specifically on gender and energy, and that was uh, from one of my specialities on energy history. So we studied two influential Swedish politicians, Birgitta Dahl and Birgit Hamreus, their personal archives and they have been the two politicians in Sweden uh, uh, doing a lot of influential work trying to transition Sweden from a large scale nuclear dependent towards a more uh, small scale and, and sustain and uh, renewable energy system um, so we uh, have Uh, looked into their personal archives and found out how much resistance these two women politicians were met by um, by uh, what we call industrial breadwinner masculinity structures and ideas about energy systems um, which uh, actors think should be large scale and there should be like um, large power plants um, in contrast to what these two women politicians wanted to see into the future. So there's a book coming out there uh, from that research project but, uh, in, in a couple of months. Then I have two, three ongoing research projects. Um, one of them is a PhD student, Anielka Wolkström, and she's studying energy practices in care um, workplaces like uh, child care uh, institutions as well as care practices and energy in eco villages trying to understand how energy is also a form of, of behavior and not only connected to electricity or other specific uh, materialities of, of energy that we first come to think about. But energy is part of other practices as well, as we know, but we tend to forget it sometimes. Then I all, I'm also part, a small part of a, <coughs> a project called the Non-Critical Exploration of Energy Practices. And that is much more about um, architecture and, and trying to imagine um, Uh, uh, non, uh, uh, beyond the gender stereotypes uh, when it comes to organizing uh, around gender behavior in, in uh, households and housing uh, collectives. And then I'm also part of the newly started uh, UCTP uh, program with Joy, Empowering All. So next slide. So from this research, I'm also taking a step further to do conceptualizations and they go beyond this binary male and female and focusing on masculinities and different forms of masculinities that I've seen in my empirical research. 
and I call them industrial breadwinner, eco-modern and ecological masculinities, trying to understand how different practices come together with values and, and how that could be related to gender ideas of gender. And we have also come uh, up with an education in which a transition from this industrial breadwinner form of masculinities towards ecological can take place that we are now piloting in Sweden and around the globe, both in Suito and um, in virtual way. Thank you. So that was a bit about my research. Great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, yeah. Can people reach out to you if they're interested in me in, in, in um, talking to you about that that stuff since you're leaving early? I just wanted to ask that question right now. Is that cool? Yes, certainly. Please send me an email or give me a phone call. Are you on LinkedIn? Uh, I'm really happy. I'm not LinkedIn, but I'm okay. on the email uh, quite many that's hours a, a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, then we go to the next person. That's going to be Joy. If there are not any specific questions at the moment. Ah, uh, yeah. From the audience. Exactly. Because Martin has to leave in the next 15 minutes. So if you have questions for him at the moment, feel free to ask now. If not, I'm interested in, in the concepts that you mentioned. So for instance, the I think it was the modern breadwinner masculinity. What's the difference between the modern one and the not modern one? So the classical, traditional breadwinner. So um, I first come up and conceptualize the industrial breadwinner masculinities in connection to research on climate change denial that I did. So um, the industrial breadwinner masculinity seems to be groups of men who are either workers within fossil fuel dependent industries or connected to those type of structures, or the CEOs or those males in, in the top of, of the fossil fuel uh, <clears throat> economic system, so to speak, or energy system. Um, and they refuse taking into account climate change knowledge at the moment. So they react with very harsh um, response towards Greta Thunberg, for example, and others <coughs> who are, and other researchers as well. So they want to conserve our very much fossil fuel dependent system at the moment. So that's the industrial breadwinner masculine. Eco-modern, eh, they are those group of, of men who are recognized in the climate crisis, but only want to solve it with uh, like uh, Tesla cars or like taking away the emissions like carbon capture and storage those type of technological solution that can keep the system as it is, um, but take away the emissions. And the ecological masculinities, they are a group of people who actually want to be part of a transition and change towards a much more ecological sound uh, relationship in between humans and nature, as well as, as in connection to emissions and, and uh, the future. Very interesting. So, do, do you think they they focus or do they do they different differentiate because of their pro environmental beliefs or how do you distinguish them just because of their attitudes towards the different parts? Was there a, one specific construct that is able to distinguish them? Um. Of course, a conceptualization like this is a is a generalization on a on a specific kind of uh, level on when you do research. So, um, for individuals, they can they can move in between industrial breadwinner, eco modern, and industrial also, depending on different situations and structures. Uh, uh, so. It is not only like you can you, know, you can pinpoint one individual as that or that, but you can illustrate a, a person with that. So to illustrate, if you say industrial bedwinning could be Donald Trump, for example. Eco-modern could be uh, Elon Musk. Uh, ecological is not so much in the maybe in the in the public, but these people are also around. Uh, transition and change the world towards this direction. Yeah. 
So it's both kind of embodied and it's also practice, but it's also values and structures. So it's it's a conceptual station trying to kind of yeah understand those kind of connections. We have Thank you. we have a yeah. question from a lady who's called iPhone, which is probably not the real name. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe you lady, you want to ask a question? <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Margrethe Bonner from the Netherlands. Hi. Um, and I, I had a further question about, about those three types of masculinity, as I understood. Uh, I was very interested in it as well. And I was wondering, am I correct that I understood it's three types of masculinity? And uh, how does this relate to femininity and, 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 and probably different types there? Very good question. Um, so I can recommend uh, an article on mobility and Swedish governance um, by Annika Kjonsen and um, co-authors. So they have tried to um, map governance structures uh, in Swedish municipalities uh, using these femininities and masculinities conceptualizations. I haven't done that, so I have focused on masculinities. Um, and um, as I see it, um, it doesn't need to be that binary femininities and masculinities either. Um, so there can be, we can understand individuals as individuals on a kind of a, um, on a scale here. In, in that sense. Uh, but if you want to know about femininities, masculinities, I can recommend that article because they try to take that into account and elaborate it in, in an interesting way. Um, it is in the Masculinities Journal Norm, I think, from 2020. Uh, uh, good question. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. It, it would be very helpful for me if you maybe could put the names their names in in the chat yeah so i, I have to write i have to write spelling yeah i yeah. do yeah yeah i do um because it, it also seemed to me that, that the third type that you describe is more integrated masculinity femininity very true but that's not yeah. a question <laughs> yeah but it's it that's of course very true because the third ecological masculinities is is inspired by and motivated by different types of ecofeminist research. So the, the, the kind of theoretical underpinnings and the um, ideas connected to ecological masculinities comes from uh, all those great ecofeminist scholars that has been uh, doing this work before me. So, so I'm indebted to, to their work uh, coming up with this ecological masculinity. That's true. Thank you very much. Mm. Great, I think that's also connected to one of the questions that was asked um, in the Live Ask chat. Um, it also focused on, or would like to know if women can have all these roles too. Um, I think it was more or less explained as well. So have a look in this paper that uh, Martin is sharing in the chat. Um, and there is another question. Um, it's asking to hear your opinion on how you would recommend to treat the gender dimension in the average gender research project. Do you have any recommendation here? <laughs> that was a big question. Uh, but I do think we need to move beyond the binary thinking in, in only men and women. Uh, um, because uh, one reason for that is um, the, the, the kind of policy implication of that um, hasn't turned out to be uh, a one-to-one -one success. So uh, more women into um, uh, positions of power hasn't um, translated in a direct way to changing the system. Uh, so therefore, I think we, we need to, to understand it not only in these binary terms, 
Uh, I also think we, we need to move away from that because of the different types of structures that we as individuals are part of. So if we if we actually gonna transform or transition the whole system, uh, we cannot only take the, the binary and, and, and adjust the men and uh, the male and female numbers. Uh, so I, I th yeah, I think in that sense, it is important to think at least one or two times about what, in which way you conceptualize gender in your research project. Yeah, definitely. I think there are many ways to implement gender in, in, in energy research. Even the question, uh, what gender do you, what would you describe yourself to? Um, is it gender? Is it sex? Is it uh, non-binary? Um, there is also a scale where you can ask for different um, dimension of uh, gender perception. So um, it doesn't have to be binary, definitely. Yeah. Um, and and very open and broad question, yeah, but probably or not even probably, definitely important, yeah. There is also a question regarding the pictures on your slide. Could you explain them a little further, what you would like to express with the images? Yeah, so we are actually working together with both uh, cartoonists and um, Design master students at the moment to uh, to change these images because uh, these images have been with us for a while, uh, but we understand their limitations. So um, so we are working on that. But uh, what we try to to show with these images is uh, the the first one. Uh, the hierarchies, um, so the, the hierarchy of the industrial breadwinner masculinities uh, and the ideas that the male body and the male person is on, on top and uh, of that type of system. And um, that also explains why they are trying to defend that kind of position or that kind of system. Um, and then the second image about eco-modern is this kind of greenwashing of a similar type of structure and a similar type of uh, system. And then the, the ecological image is trying to understand this. Oh, how can we actually recognize that we humans are part and intrinsically linked to ecological processes and that they are circulating and also, of course, that we use um, the, 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 um, the colors of um, the LGBTQ movement there and the pride colors. So we also try to use the colors there. But we are working on those images um, currently so that they can be even more self-explanatory than that, that they are now. Thank you. I think the question also referred rather to the second on the right hand, the okay. second image. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That image is trying to visualize that one of the things um, that if we if we talk about men as in these binary terms. Um, that men has a problem of listening both to women and to nature. So th that image is um, an illustration of our education in which we are trying to have rules uh, in our uh, groups in which we learn to listen both to each other and to nature uh, a bit more carefully. Uh, which I haven't really done now. I have been speaking for uh, almost 20 minutes, but... Uh, <laughs> but yeah. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Be because, you know, we know that you need to leave now. Yeah. Soon yeah. Um, so we try to get some questions beforehand so there is enough time to answer them. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Then, Martin, thanks for joining us. Um, have fun um, <laughs> with your yeah, other great. meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um,
Great Looking questions. forward to have you back. Actually, yeah. I had this idea maybe of asking, yeah, maybe, yeah. Well, we'll send you an email. We'll do figure that. out what we can do in the future. Okay, Martin, take care. Have a good weekend. Um, Thank you. Now, now we switch to the next person. That's going to be Joy now. Um, <laughs> um, since uh, Sabina told me, no, it's not Joy yet. We'll ask questions to Martin, but now it's Joy's <laughs> turn. So, Joy, kick it off. You've got five okay. minutes. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Julius. Um, I should say that I'm actually speaking on behalf of my colleague, uh, Mariella Veenstra, that uh, we, we produced this uh, together. Unfortunately, Mariella is uh, not av uh, able to join us uh, this morning, so I'll have to do my best to answer her questions on, from, on behalf of both of us, and so all the faults are mine, not, uh, not hers. So, um, the, so can I have the next uh, slide then, please? What I tried to do is to, to show how our uh, research has, well, we both primarily started in the global south of looking at gender and energy uh, issues uh, there. And I think that every, uh, that, in many ways, most of the early evidence came from the global south, but increasingly I'm aware that uh, there has been work on women and energy in the global north been going on for some time, but it's often hidden and in other, other subjects. So just a couple of things that uh, we learned uh, that we think um, apply also to the North. And in the IEA user TCP that, uh, that Martin uh, referred to is that we that the countries who are involved in this are only from the global North. Um, we are not very happy about this but so Mariella and I together with the support of Martin and other colleagues say we have to listen to the global south as well they they can teach us in the north a lot and uh, so just following on from what Martin said that we are very clear that uh, having sex disaggregated data as your starting point is is uh, the, the very it's very important and to go beyond this binary of as he was saying men and women and use intersectionality that 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 human beings are characterized by a whole range of social characteristics which uh, which create an identity and that identity is fluid and it changes at different moments and certainly across the the life uh, life cycle i think also Another issue that came up is how complex households are, that you get this data which says, yes, and, you know, sort of in men headed households and women headed households, you get uh, so much energy being used. But households are complex. Households can be multigenerational. They can be um, that they can be. Um, consist of people uh, living in a compound who are different family uh, entities. So just using this kind of very simplistic um, approach misses a whole range of issues. They're fluid, they change over the time. For example, uh, we know in Nepal, there is a lot of male migratory labor to the, to the Middle East. And that changes the gender roles and relations and we see evidence uh, for for that um i was, I was a bit was sort of uh, when i saw female um, and uh, energy efficiency so i put in one comment on, to do with the energy efficiency which is at the moment the things called the sustainable development goals which the un is uh, promoting um cooking is one of the primary energy uh, sources of uh, of activity sorry that source of, of uh, interest and when um, cooking is is always seen as a female uh, role there's a lot to say on that but it's promoted uh, improved cook stoves are promoted as a health issue not as an energy efficiency issue so for, for sorry for the the one or two people who are engineers uh, listening to to this and I think one of the important things is when promoting uh, new technologies is that men hold the purse strings right so next slide please um, now to look at the lessons from the global north, um, we've, this is work that Mariella and I have done on behalf of the FEM Committee of the European Parliament. We've noticed two issues dominate. One is the issue of energy poverty and one is uh, women in the energy sector. 
Now, this is uh, this is not to say there aren't more issues, but these are the two that have been the ones that most people have been looking at at the at the moment. But one thing that we can say is that more women live in energy poverty in, than men in Europe, and that the that there's been a, a problem of actually getting this recognised. Policymakers don't like to think that this, this exists, that people don't have enough energy. This is a problem of the global south, not the global north. So that's been taking some time to get uh, that, that actually recognized. Now, what I would, would, uh, would caution is about what I call the numbers game. Having more women doing something on a committee or whatever does not necessarily mean more progress to gender equality. I think that it's much more complicated uh, than, than that. Not all women are sisters. Right? So I think that's an important thing uh, to, uh, to, get to bear in mind. And I think what happens when you get women who are put into a particular position, you heard the example Martin gave about uh, using women's voices about uh, health and safety in the nuclear uh, industry. It's, it lets men off the hook. It's gender equality is a shared responsibility. It's not a responsibility of women only. And so that's one of the reasons I'm really very excited about the work that Martin is, is, uh, is doing. Um, we, uh, Mariella wanted me to mention this particular analytical framework that we've been using, which shows that the way that differences are in energy uh, um, come out. One is to do with biological, uh, to do, particularly to do with heat and uh, stress or cold. Um, the other is the social attitudes, the energy poverty of not having enough energy to meet your daily needs are, um, lead to social exclusion. And well, the economic is, is rather obvious, I think. The last slide, because I just wanted to draw this to, together, I think to, to, to show the commonalities, this is a very nice comment that comes from the book that we've been shamelessly promoting on, on the first and last slide um, from Mariama Williams um, from the Southern Center. She reviewed the work that Mariella and I had done on um, energy poverty in Europe. And she said, while there are many similarities between experiences of energy poverty by women in the South and the North, the constraints behind the demand and the survival responses are quite different. I think that's that's a really very interesting uh, remark. And so last last slide is just to say thank you. Last one. Last slide. No, I think that, I, that's it. You took you took away my last slide, which said thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, never mind. Okay, if would you, Sabina? Could sorry. I just make two? Sorry, could I be really indul self indulgent and just make two comments about or a comment related to the sort to the to the backgrounds of the people who are participating? Yes, of course. It, it I, I know it's not a very statistically scientific example, but I'm not surprised. I, it has been a real struggle in the energy sector to get gender specialists interested. I, and this is a few years ago, but I went to one of my academic research networks, which um, is, was the gender group, and I talked about energy and gender. And they all sat there and looked very politely at me and then one and said to me, Joy, what's this got to do with us? Uh, it's been a real battle. Not uh, mm -hmm. not only amongst academics, but getting Unifem to uh, and you know the national level to get gender officers interested in energy. They don't see the the uh, the relevance, and also physical scientists. Um, the you know the also. Trying to, to convince men that, or male engineers that this is irrelevant, particularly the gender equality, they don't see the, they don't don't see the relevance uh, of it. Uh, they see the relevance of gender equality, but not in the in the uh, work. Um, and if you want a good example of not understanding uh, gender issues related to energy, the solar cooker. Think about that one. <laughs> okay. Thank you for taking a bit longer. <laughs> Let me take a bit longer. What, what, what that? What does that mean, Joy? What do you mean, solar cooker? Why, oh, solar cooker. I, are, you, are you an engineer or a, do you have a technical background, Julius? No, 
Like, oh, okay. no. I know what a solar well, cooker is, but why is that such a such a good example as you just pointed out? Um, they all designed engineering for so problem solving the problems of women in the South. Oh, very much so. You you know, you when's when is a solar cooker the most efficient? Noon, when the sun is at the highest. Which person uh, I, which woman wants to go and stand outside in the noonday sun to, to cook? Right. And there are whole also sets of cultural issues involved uh, as well, that people can see what you're cooking. Oh, she can't afford this. It, it then becomes a social stigma issue. You can't walk away from it in case someone steals your food or the cooker itself. It, uh, uh, no. Uh, uh, yes. That's, uh, so that's just in a nutshell. Why, uh, I mean, it's a wonderful technology. You can do wonderful calculations on your CAD CAM. You know, oh, there's the orientation of the uh, the sun's rays. Yeah, I can make the so. Yeah, it's a great technical thing, but it, it is completely diverse from the from the the cultural aspects and also the climatic conditions in which you're intending to use it. That's when the the person who invents something is very different from the person who uses it, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. If we have this discrepancy, it's it's difficult. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's also in this in the, in in Europe, it's generally men who design kitchens, and it's still women who are responsible in the <clears throat> predominantly for for cooking, even in the north. Hopefully not. Hopefully that will change in the future. <laughs> uh, oh, and not in my household, I have to say. Uh, the person who brought the coffee in before, he's in charge in our kitchen. So. <laughs> Perfect. But Joy, um, it's so easy. It's Sorry, like, I mean, I got to say something up here. It's, Joy, it's so easy to, 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 to say that this solution is not good. And I understand your reasons, like that it's not, it's not designed for the customer or the, the, the target group or, you know, also this, this judgment from the other people in the village or wherever that mm -hmm. cooker is up. But then, you know, it's always easy to, to, uh, to criticize, but then what would you, what would be your idea? You know, if, if people, if you don't want to use gasoline, but you want to use the sun, um, isn't it that the idea is in general is good. It just needs to, some tweaks and, and how, how, how it can be implemented in ways that it's more like, I don't even know what word to use, like more social inclusive or like more, more targeted to the cost, to the user, because it's easy to say it's a, sh it's a shitty product, you know, <laughs> but then what other options do we have in such communities? You know, first of all, I would ask the person that you're targeting, whether this is a product that they, uh, that they want. And if so, it's say, well, what do you want from this product? And that, oh, that generally doesn't happen. It's getting, it is getting a bit better. Uh, so you, okay, so I understand your critique more like a processual critique of like the idea could be good, but the way how it is done is not good, and there's more interaction needed with the people who are going to use it in order to sh shape it in a way that it's more uh -huh. more catering to their needs. And also, is it a priority? I mean, okay, there could be in your household, there could be other priorities where, uh, where yeah. stuff needs yeah. to be done. Okay, yeah, cool. So okay, thanks for that clarification, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, Sabine, do you, how, how do we go? Do we want to ask the questions from Life Ask or do you want us to some, ask, ask some questions? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. We can, we can ask the question from Life Ask or we can go on to the next presentation. Um. Maybe one more question because I think it's quite specific. Um, the the it, first one? No, you go. You go. It, it asks about the uh, how can we overcome the north south divide and how can we learn more from the south, as you said. That's one of the questions asked here. Oh, gosh, that's a bit. <laughs> how can we end the north south divide? That's a bit like uh, asking uh, Martin the question he did well i think one thing is by actually asking people from from the south uh, what 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 do they want i mean uh, to, get, to give them back control of the uh, if you want a, a global term the development agenda and i think also to making sure that women's voices are heard because that that's actually quite difficult to do but there are there's some lots of very exciting um ways of of appearing now in in, in doing this of trying to get the voices from the bottom up so um, so 
yeah, I think it's about listening to people. I mean, that's one of the things that we've argued is, is about, you know, looking at the experiences of, of men and women in the South to, to address energy poverty and seeing the relevance in the North. One of the issues which has came out in energy poverty in Europe, which is, is which was came as a shock to, to us as well, is that there are women in um, in Eastern Europe who are cooking on fuel wood. And this is not trendy, eco, you know, sort of non-fossil fuel. This is because women cannot afford anything else. And so they are also being exposed to the levels of smoke that we associate with with uh, with with uh, cooking with wood in 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 the south. So that's certainly an issue that we can uh, can learn learn from. Uh, so I think it is it's it's exploring the uh, the. The, where there is a commonality and where we can learn from and support each other. I mean, I think that uh, that certainly when an issue becomes something in the north, you can see how much money is thrown at it. Present okay. circumstance. And another issue, which is not necessarily an energy issue, if you don't, I mean, on my development hobby horse, is is um, how many people die every day of malaria and how this that that how relatively little is goes into malaria research a lot does but i mean it could be a lot more and what would solve the issue of malarial research is if malaria became endemic in the southern usa again it used to be but it isn't anymore and that's that's one of the that's one of the issues that I've been talking with another colleague of mine uh, about what gets on the research agenda, who drives the research agenda. Yeah, and of course, that... the research agenda is, is what, what where does the funding uh, go? I mean, to give you an energy example of this, um, and then I will stop because we must let others talk. Yes, is yeah. is is to do with the whole cooking issue of of now there is lots of really excellent research going into you know health related to sm smoke exposure however there isn't there are other problems related to the fuel wood chain which includes carrying the fuel wood on your head 20 kilograms every you know a couple of times a week over for 50 years of your life there is very little research done on the consequences of that the physical consequences. There's some evidence to suggest that it can affect the uterus, but very little, very little work uh, on on this. And of course, there is also the issue that women are subjected to sexual uh, and physical harassment while as out collecting fuel wood. But so that the, the, the research that's um, available on that is very limited, very limited. So that's yeah. what I mean about examples of the work, because well, Ma Ma Joy, and sorry, I have Joy. We only have twenty-seven minutes. To yes, do I shut up. To the now. Other two I'm people. shutting up. Shutting it's up. really interesting. I, I, I think you, I like your voice very much, and I like the way you tell stories. It's really cool. It's really nice. Um, okay, now we go to Ines. Um, Ines, <laughs> if you're ready now, uh, you got your four to five minutes. Because if each of the, the other two has five minutes presentation, five minutes talk uh, questions, then we only have ten minutes in the end, which is already a bit a bit short. So, Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I tried to stick to the key message as short as I can. I have no slides prepared, and as I'm in scientific administration now, I'm not doing actual research. But my view on research, there are three points I would like to share with you. The first thing, and this has been mentioned by Joy several times already, is let data speak and invest in diversity monitoring and in gender monitoring. And let data speak means um, let data indicate the gaps, especially in setting the research agenda. Who asks the question whose perspective is reflected in each research proposal, research project, and so on. And um, by being represented, I do not only refer to career development, but also to visibility, participation, decision-making, resource allocation, and gather data on that. And this leads me to the second issue I would like to share in this context with you. And the keyword is gender budgeting. And gender budgeting means um, check the allocation of resources. And by resources, I do not only mean money, but also power, time, 
access, space, independence, integrity, and resources like this, and check how the allocation of these resources impact gender. And um, there are two main questions to ask. First, is this research, resource gender relevant? And if so, is the current allocation of this resource um, empowering or hindering female impact, female perspectives? Um, this refers to solutions that are found like the solar cooker. This is refers to the questions that are asked and so on and so on. This is kind of a meta perspective, this gender budgeting of resources. And the first point, uh, the third point I would like to share is um, take group differences, binary or non-binary, maybe as a starting point, but do not end there, but go beyond the group differences and check for the impact that these group differences may have, and also check for explanations. Like um, this goes together under the keyword of gendered. Um, Explain uh, gendered innovations. Also, there's a, um, a huge resource out there by uh, Londa Schiebinger, and she has method sections, and she has, um, or the team more or less, has also a section on environment and energy as well, and how to integrate female perspectives into the research, and uh, um, also with uh, explanations for the differences that you might find in your data. Is there are out um, in literature, some theories why these differences appear, and it makes so much more sense to check uh, to to build up hypotheses upon these um, theories than only stop as, at describing group differences. Well, these are my three kind of uh, points I would like to share in this context. Thank you. Great, Ines. Thank you for that. Um, before we go into questions to you, um, you mentioned this. Probably this name of I think it's a lady she does something and you said it's a tip. Do you want to share a link to that web page or that resource that you mentioned just here Definitely. in the link so that people can click on it? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Maybe that makes it easier. Um, and then Sabine, do we have questions on this? I didn't see it. I would I would wouldn't mind asking a question uh, to Ines. You talked about gender budgeting and I was wondering whether you could give some examples, um, like hands-on examples how. Um, how to implement this gender budgeting um, topic into the research administration or the research funding um, in an organization, but also maybe on, on the on the funding uh, on the granting side where the money is coming from. You are asking me now to get yes. some. Uh, <laughs> Let's be honest. I'm a starter in this issue. I uh, had attended some uh, workshops on this topic, but I'm not in the details of implementing. And there are lots of resources um, in the internet, also by the University of Graz, for example, I can share a link as well, where there's a whole like a workflow and um, do's and don'ts and how to do this. And it's uh, about transparency and putting the processes and the decision making transparent of how resources are allocated. And it again, 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 starts with data to collect who is deciding what based on what criteria and so on. It's a matter of transparency. But I'm going to share the link as well. Cool. That's good. Yeah. Perfect. There is also a question that's, I think, quite related. It, it's asking, why isn't gender monitoring, as you just has mentioned, have mentioned it, uh, a mandatory item in, for instance, European projects? I think the question, and I hear yeah, well, the thing is, who benefits from that? Who's taking the decision? And I, I'm convinced if the boards who decides on these are more diverse, uh, it would have been mandatory um, already. And it also, you know, it's um, um, it, there's a very interesting quote that says, uh, equality appears in the eyes of the privileged like oppression. And this emotional reaction is very strong. And there's some people benefit benefit from intransparency and it's a way to fight through that transparency benefits all in the end. But, but I am quite optimistic that we are on a good way with that. But yeah, I, I agree. I think it's also most of the research focuses or the general research is this, um, this construct of weird people, weird standing for white 
um, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And even though it only covers a few people from the general population, it's the majority that's always present and always visible um, and not looking into all the other categories that are even more spread in the general population. Yeah, I, I agree. So this, this question of, of who, who sets the research ag agenda and who shares the money and allocates it, yeah, I think that's an important one, definitely. Are there more questions from the audience for Ines regarding her three main topics? I think Sabine is super cool that you actually came up with inviting Ines because it's Ines is not this researcher but looks yes. more at from the admission and, and now I really realize why this is actually very valuable. So thank you Ines for for joining us here today. Yeah. Definitely. Do we want to continue but then? Yes. Cool. Okay, Josephine, I hope you are watching at the computer right now and that you can turn on your, your video. Here we go. Here she is. Uh, Sabine, would you mind going to the next slide? Here we go. Okay, Josephine, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I want to give a brief insight in one research we did in team, um, which um, Sabine was a part of also. And um, yeah, uh, we did a scoping review um, to find um, blind spots uh, on this. Um, yeah both topics together, gender and environment. And yeah, um, we did, um, yeah, um, or we wanted to, to, to have a, in, in a secondary step, we wanted to, to make a, a more detailed review. And so we wanted to identify where other research gets. So, um, and we had some inclusion criteria, um, which were, um, we selected reviews from 2010 to 2020, uh, worldwide published and uh, peer, in peer reviewed journals. And uh, we selected those who had gender and at least one aspect of environmental protection uh, in the title or in the abstract. Yeah, and we also, of course, had a, a method, method uh, approach uh, from Arxi and O'Malley and Livac. Um, yeah, and we searched in uh, Web of Science, like Info, Psych Index, and EconLit. And yeah, I have uh, some small um, results. Um, we have, in, finally, from our primary uh, sample, it was 500. Uh, 20, something like this. And then we selected uh, 48 peer-reviewed reviews. Um, yeah, and as you can see in this uh, slide or in this graph, um, there's uh, an yeah, um, increase of interest in those both topics together. <laughs> and yeah, you also see that we categorized it in um, if it was a main aspect or a minor aspect, or if gender was a main aspect. And what we identified also is interesting that there were some um, uh, reviews already on meat consumption and masculinity that was um, well, yeah was found very often. And then you can uh, read um, for yourself uh, yeah which was the main uh, topics. Yeah. Um, now you can skip to the next second um, slide, Sabina. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can see maybe this uh, maps uh, to what you said, Ines, um, who did the research and who was studied. <laughs> and yeah, as you can see, we have um, also here, um, of course, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, something like a north-south divide. Um, yeah, we can see that um, mostly re the research is done from uh, the yeah northern side and few points, but of course, um, we, are, we found some reviews also um, yeah, on African um, uh, or who targeted African women, especially in the in, um, in the agriculture sector. There were some studies, yeah. But I don't need to go in detail here as well. Um, what I wanted to show you is that yeah, we have um, blind spots a lot, <laughs> and um, I see them um, yeah um, yeah. For, um, Foremost in the in the, this uh, southern thing, which uh, which was said already, yeah, and um, yeah, our summary or implications were in brief that yeah, there is an increased interest, and we need to target this um, gender and environment um, gap, or we need to to think them together um, increasingly, and yeah, interdisciplinary interdisciplinary perspectives are very important. What also um, came to my mind is that. Um, yeah, we also need to address, or when I speak about psychological research, the underlying drivers of when we fi find differences between um, male and female. And this is often something which is, yeah, it is um, 
yeah, it is mentioned but not discussed. And yeah, there I see very much to do. Um, yeah, maybe we can discuss on this thing also. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, maybe the ne next slide. Oh no, that's there. Uh, thank you to the team who, uh, yeah, those four people who are in uh, involved in this project. Yeah, that's all. Great. Thanks, Ines. Queen is, uh, Josefine. Um, <laughs> Kling. Um, yeah. Um, so, people, are there questions that you want to directly ask to Josefine? I, um, Sabine, co correct me. I didn't see yet questions in live ask that go directly to Josefine. Is that correct? Me neither, yeah. But what I really liked was this the comparison of the maps. Um, of course, I, I'm already familiar with them, but this it, this really brings up this question that we also had with Ines, this who does the research and who studies who who studies. So this this I think it can be really difficult to do research about a group that you're not part of, right? Um so maybe that also explains why here in the audience there are more women than men, <laughs> because maybe more female researchers prefer to look at yeah gender topics and also do research on yeah mostly women who are in a less positive uh, position. Um, but maybe I, I, that's just my an open question, a comment. So I'm I'm happy to hear your thoughts also from the audience. If you have any, um, and if there's no questions, then I, Sabine and me, we agreed that we would open up the the floor now, so that if you if you don't have specific questions to Josefina, you could also ask very general, like open up your microphone, open up your your video camera, and have contributions or have questions to any of the three speakers that are still here. So that will be Joy, Ines, and Josefina. And we'll just have a conversation for the last 13 minutes uh, until the session ends. And of course, we will um, focus on the question that you have already asked in live ask. Um, we could also, so go, yeah. Maybe the first one, the, the highest one at the moment is, um, it doesn't matter who's answering. Um, why does okay now it changed? <laughs> um, oh, it changed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should still do that project question, though. I think it's really important and interesting. Yeah, definitely. So maybe the first one that's now the highest up is someone said that I struggled so far in finding entry points for how to make gender matter um, constructively for supporting energy transition, and it seems to me so far that design thinking seems to be a way. So is any one of the three of you uh, willing and uh, capable of having some good thoughts on this question? Ines? I'm not sure if this is a good answer or not. The spontaneous answer is that the design thing is a very bright idea and it combines, so to say, the des design thinking approach is more qualitative, a more creative approach, while the data, on the other hand, of, is uh, like the quantitative very systematic approach and combining these two let's say pathways to get an angle would be very helpful and very often uh, both approaches can point you at some issues where then you can go on and have a further a deeper look inside to a combination of qualitative and quantitative as usual it seems promising from my point of view definitely that also fits to Josefina's um, uh, point here on this slide that we already see the interdisciplinary perspective is important right mm. but if we if we leave this design thinking part out of it i would like to ask joy since you probably have just most experience with uh um with getting people into or like to integrating gender and energy transitions um would you would you mind sharing some of your experiences how, how people can connect it or how can people get engaged in that topic to bring these two topics together Oh, gosh, yes. Um, I, I mean, I think what Ines has said is, is, is also a, a good point, is that um, policymakers are influenced by number, but number doesn't always offer explanation. And I, so I think that's where the sort of uh, the the, uh, the qualitative data comes in of, of, uh, of offering explanation. 
And I think then you, um, I mean, my own pragmatic uh, standpoint, which may not be popular with everybody, is that I don't, I don't push uh, taking a gender approach as a, as a, as a, a gateway to gender equality that will that comes anyway but to say that look if you take a gender approach of starting by even just separating your data out between what is men and women particularly in Europe the European policy makers know that they have to be committed to social inclusion and so that's I think is the, the, the sort of way around it as a strategy to, to reach your own own goals, which if, if that is I assume that most of the, the, the all this audience is gender equality. So and I think demonstrating that uh, that you know that by taking this disaggregated approach that you then knew problems you were not necessarily aware of existed like for example I say that you know the one I mentioned on cooking on fieldwood so that's what I would say start by showing what um what benefits this brings to the person that you are trying to uh, to convince and I mean we we called it a number of years ago Margaret Scutch and I called this project efficiency Everybody wants their project to succeed or their intervention, and this is a way to help them to get it to succeed. That's my that's my approach. I think that also more or less answers the question that's at the moment highest: why not only the number of women uh, helps, and what else should be should be considered um, to explain that a little deeper. So, if there are other thoughts on that, why it's not only the number. Yeah, Ines, go ahead. Yes, thanks. For it, I would like to uh, emphasize that the number counts, but still it doesn't help if there are informal networks, informal decision making. So you can have the share, uh, the equal numbers in the board, but then if the decision is made aside on, on some background places or something, it doesn't help a lot. And so it's much more what meaning like beyond the lines what happens there and so it also is important to analyze the decision processes how the decisions are made are the criteria clear can someone else um check the decision afterwards and stuff like this yeah and it's it's again about gender budgeting the allocation of resources it doesn't help if you have 50 percent females and 50 percent males in a lab and then the females have a space of one meter lab bench and the, and the males have much more so it's also the are the structures inclusive this is the question do we accidentally or on purpose exclude someone from participation from the power and you can by equal numbers still exclude people from decision making What do you want to say there? Yes. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Um, I think two aspects that come up regularly during the, your talks and also one question is related to it are um, the non-binary uh, perspective and another one is this yeah, intersectionality. So do you have any comments on those aspects? Any thoughts that you would like to share? Sabina, before we go into that, can you tell me and maybe also people in the audience what inter intersectionality actually means? Yeah, that you're not only part of, or usually you're not part of one group, but you're part of several groups. And if you're part of several groups that are minorities or uh, very vulnerable, um, then this is an intersectionality. So if two groups intersect and you're part of both groups, very roughly. Could I uh, add, add to this? I mean, the the UK I think is quite unusual in within the uh, Greater Europe of uh, actually collecting data that is uh, the, the the government level or that is disaggregated across ethnicity. And what, one of the things that you see it's not an, an energy aspect, but I think one of the things that shows how 
important this is, is that in the COVID uh, response to uh, taking up the vaccine, how in the UK, Okay, that the, uh, certain groups of, from the uh, ethnic minorities have not been taking it up. And so that immediately made that the, that, um, that a lot of the municipalities have then developed a strategy of reaching out to those groups. So I think that that's, uh, it's, okay, sorry, it's not an energy uh, one, but it does begin to demonstrate the value that you, that you are behaving towards your citizens in an inclusive way. Thank you, Joy. I think there was also, okay, Julius, you would like to add something. I think Ines mm -hmm. also wants to like to add something. Then Ines goes first, please. Yes, this is actually a good argument um, why counting numbers doesn't help alone, because you can't, where, will, where do you want to finish with counting which dimension, how many people of this category, how many people of this category, and so on, and then you end up with fighting dimension against dimension. And so it leads us back, or let's say the numbers leads us back to inclusive structures. So does everyone has the same chance to be part of the game? And this would help whatever combination of diversity dimension you bring with you. So the numbers might indicate that, okay, our structures are not inclusive, our culture is not inclusive. So my focus would be like uh, inspired by the numbers, check for the inclusiveness of structures. And so it, um, the intersectionality is a very, very important approach and it guides us towards not only counting persons of a one dimension in a board or something. Okay, Sabine, we're approaching the last four minutes. I would suggest that we do one last question and a very practical question. Um, and while we do this question, maybe Sabine, you can already show the la uh, like the, the last slide with the connect. Yeah, one further maybe the thank you slide, so that people can actually see how they can get into contact with our lovely participants here. So the last question um, that I would like to ask today is, um, and that's the, the, the it's also the, the highest ranking question that remains here is like, how can we actually treat and integrate? the gender dimension in the average, whatever average means, average energy research project. So maybe Ines, Josefina, and Joy, you have some, some, some good ideas on this. How can we integrate the, research, the gender dimension into normal, uh, whatever normal is again, uh, it's a hard way to, I think using the word normal is really not, not right here, but using them in a vast majority of research projects. So Joy, Ines, Josefina, if you have thoughts, uh, take your turn, please. Maybe I can start. Um, first thing would be the awareness of the researcher that it is an important thing and then to collaborate with people who say, yeah, we want to look uh, into detail maybe. And then also, I, I think the thing would be um, how to get money for this research also. But uh, we, I think we need to address it um, in every re research we do. Um, for example, I think over on, we are now starting uh, to research how the... Um, uh, Wasserstoff, mm, how hydrogen. It? Hydrogen, uh, yeah, on hydrogen. Uh, and my um, opinion is that it's also a very um, male-dominated discussion, and we, ha yeah, there we can um, trap into um, the same as we have found in all these efficiency um, stuff we have already researched. And um, what you said, Joy, at the beginning, or yeah, uh, just ask those people who you need this technology. So I'm asking, hmm. Where are the women? <laughs> so this is something we could do in, uh, as team um, or as a research institute to have a, to have um, the awareness of researching this and yeah to get this um, as an important thing in discussion. Ines, Joy. Well, okay. Uh, since I unmuted myself already, I would say make it as a standard to reflect on a meta level some aspects of your business, of your project. Like as you check the finances, so check the diversity of the structures. Just as a routine, go through and make it kind of a standard mand mandatory point to reflect upon in research, uh, in um, project conceptualization. So that not for every project, again, you have to defend the gender perspective, but just to have it as a quality standard 
to check certain things as you check money and your time and so check the diversity and the inclusiveness of your project as that a standard really, team. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah, that and I think that makes a lot of sense. Joy, your your last your last if you're cents. if you're a researcher uh, and you apply for European uh, uh, Union funding, you have to conclude a, a gender dimension, which is not uh, only just counting the number of women in in your team. Um, I would say also look at your own team. You know how diverse, and it's again not only men uh, women here. How diverse is your team? There's lots of uh, research to say that a diverse uh, team doesn't matter what you're doing, but a diverse team gives you uh, really good uh, um, uh, outputs. So I think that's uh, that's something uh, to think about. And yes, make sure that your uh, that your research or what you're aiming at also does think about those those issues and always collect disaggregated data. Perfect. I think those were perfect last statements. And um, <laughs> I'm very happy that you were able to share your thoughts. And I'm also happy and thank you as the audience um, for asking questions and for being being interested in this uh, topic and for joining this session. So thank you to all of you, also to Julius and also to Elisabeth who also uh, worked on the concept with us um, to get this session together. So thank you, um, Ines, Josephine, Joy, and of course, Martin, who's not here anymore. And um, I hope we will continue this discussion on gender and feel free to reach out and get in touch our email address are available here and sabine thank you for being the driving force on this session today yeah i thank you to the two of you for for organizing it too so uh, yeah enjoyed it cool thank you see you soon everyone yeah bye bye